Did you remember any positive time or did you believe everything that you were told? Is your connection with your alienated parent as loving and strong as you wished for or do you just casually talk to each other now? What do you think is the biggest misconception about alienated kids? Is there anything that you guys would say to any people out there who are currently alienating their children or anything you would say to your alienator? Some of my first memories of my childhood were of my mother telling me that my father didn't love me. I felt closest to my mom when we were talking crap about my dad. If I rejected my dad, I felt like I was getting my mom's approval. Question, do I really know this person? Are they actually who my alienator said they were? I had this overwhelming sense of having to protect my mom. In her mind, she truly believes everything she's saying, that my dad was a terrible person all the time. I did start asking questions, and I did want to fact check. There are some people out there who truly believe that the abuse I went through for 20 years, parental alienation, does not exist. And I've maintained since the start that although it's not our responsibility, it is going to come down to the child survivors to speak out and band together and demand change for the next generation of kids who are going through this. A few weeks ago, I asked everybody in my social media accounts, what would you want to ask a former alienated child? I received tons of questions, thank you. Today's video basically answers the question, what would it look like to get five child survivors of parental alienation into one space in order to ask them questions from targeted parents? Well, it would look something like this episode that you're about to watch. Enjoy. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's really encouraging and inspiring to have more and more people join our support group and also to have more people want to speak out and share their stories. I'm really proud of all of you guys. I'm happy to connect with you guys and do this Q&A. Uh, I think most people know my story, but for anybody who's new to my project, I will just give a brief summary. I was alienated from my dad by my mom starting at the age of eight. It really solidified at the age of nine when they got divorced. And I would be pretty severely alienated from my dad for the next 20 years. And I figured everything out about a year and a half ago. It's been really difficult, but in meeting other people who've been through this very specific form of abuse, I've been able to find healing and recover at a, a much more rapid pace. And it's been great so far to meet all of you guys. So if you could go around and just give a brief summary of how parental alienation has affected your life, that would be awesome. I'll dive in. I was alienated as long as I can remember. My parents split when I was about one and then my dad moved to another city. So uh, my mom had full control of the storyline. I was pretty severely alienated until about my late twenties when I went through a whole lot of therapy and decided I was gonna forgive my dad and it wasn't until my early 40s that I realized that all the things I was forgiving him for um, really weren't true. And it wasn't until I was almost 50 and my own children um, were showing signs of alienation that I started looking into what this phenomenon was actually called. I realized that it had happened to me and that now it was happening to my children. And my alienator was my mom, and she is actively participating in alienating my kids from me. My uh, alienator was also my mom. I think that the alienation actually started uh, long before um, their divorce. My mom was very emotionally dysregulated, and my parents fought a lot during their marriage. Um, so from about the age of seven, or as early as I could remember, I kind of felt responsible in um, helping regulate my mom's emotions and she would kind of use me as a therapist. So there was a lot of venting about my dad that she would do. And so it kind of made me, made me feel afraid of him and made me angry towards him. And then it wasn't until I was like older as an adult where I started to really think back on those times and, and through my childhood that I was kind of thinking like the things that she was doing really wasn't okay. My parents got divorced um, about when I was 
14 and they had pretty messy divorce and very messy custody battle. My mom had ref- had filed for so many restraining orders for really frivolous things like, you know, my sister didn't have her orthodontic headgear. You know, she wasn't wearing it at his house. My younger sister's you know, their clothes didn't match or their shoes were on the wrong feet or their homework wasn't completed. All these different things where it was like, you shouldn't think that somebody shouldn't have access to their child over these things, but she was trying so hard to just annihilate him using the court system. Um, It got to a point where my dad was so much drowning in legal fees to fight the custody battle and just fight to be able to have us or have access to us on top of paying child support that he could no longer afford to live here in the same state. And he was pretty much forced to go move out of state. When my when my dad decided to move away, my mom told me and my sister, we won. And when we asked her for clarification, like, what does that mean? She said that the judge saw how bad my dad is and put a restraining order on him on our behalf. It didn't make sense to me. Like, I didn't know what to think about it, but I, there was no way for me to question it. I tried to reconcile my relationship with my dad in my 20s um, for about seven years. And my mom was still at this point um, sabotaging our relationship with our dad, which long story short, it just made it look as if we were giving intel to our dad or to our mom about our dad is how he felt. And when he felt that way, he was kind of pulling away and disconnecting from us, which we felt like he didn't want us. You know, everything that we had worked for to rebuild our relationship crumbled. When I had gone no contact with my mom for other toxic behaviors that she did, I learned the truth that the restraining order I was told Exi- that existed what did not actually exist that really that really wrecked me because that when I tried to reconcile with my dad before and I would go visit him I literally thought I was breaking the law to see my dad and it caused a lot of anxiety so to, to learn that that wasn't true it, I really struggled with it so um now I'm at a point where I I, I mean I, I still hate that this happened but I feel like I'm not in such a dark place as I was before for me, um, my mom was the one that was trying to alienate me from my dad. It really only kicked in when I was around five. I started telling him that she was abusing me. That's where she started using the court system and... Um, here in Canada, CAS, um, to fully take me away from him and start trying to turn the allegations on him that he was the one that was doing it. So I was fully taken away by five, and then with the court systems, everything kind of pushed that idea onto me. And so I was told and berated, and my dad wasn't allowed any contact with me. He would use that against it and just, like say that he didn't want contact with you, um, that he didn't love you. So I was fully alienated and gone from him by five, and I wasn't allowed contact with him. So I was made to believe that he didn't love me, and all of this was a manipulation. Um, so I started getting back in contact with him by the time I was 18, when I had left the house um, for university. Yeah, it was just crazy finding out the truth. She hid a lot of things from me to be able to keep the lie going. So it's been a whirlwind. Um, hi, my name is Jacqueline. I'm 28. And I was um, alienated from my dad in the same home. My dad worked uh, third shift. So it was me and my mom home in the evenings. And then by the time he got home, I was already gone for school. And from age 11, my mom was relentless with her campaign of denigration which um, I mean the smear campaign it seemed like it never ended I figured out the truth when I was 23 I'm also in a place of I feel like a good place right now I feel like I have made sense of everything I also have very limited relationships with both of my parents this has impacted my life in every single way 
Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you guys for being willing to be here. I know that this is scary and I just commend all of you for your bravery. Tina, would you mind starting with some of the questions that people sent in? Okay, first one. I'm wondering how you felt about or dealt with any extended family members who continued to align themselves with the alienator once you reunited with your targeted parent, like your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, perhaps. Um, I can start with it by answering this one. For me, I find myself having more understanding of what they're going through because I've seen my dad through my mom's lens for so long that I can understand how other people might be tricked into seeing me through her lens. So I do have a lot of understanding for it. And that kind of helps me from being angry at other people in my family who have essentially taken sides. For me, I'm the complete opposite. (laughs) It's been tough to have it thrown in your face, basically. I just want to blame them for what's happening, for not questioning enough or for not like pushing enough to see, to hear about a hurting child, you know, to just want to take the happiness. And I think I put a lot of the blame on extended family instead of the abuser, alienator, but I hold a lot of resentment for them. So it's been hard to have relationships. I feel like it, there's more of a distant relationship for me. For, for my mom, it, her parents really helped her be able to alienate my dad. They supported her through thick and thin, never told her though what she was doing, like she was taking it too far or anything like that. So I am working on my resentment towards them because I feel like they they should have known better or they should have, you know, been the voice of reason. I don't know. I, I feel like I rocked the boat by learning the truth and acting accordingly because um, now I'm estranged from my mom. So yeah, it, it did definitely change the dynamics with some other family members. This one looked like it came in more than once. And the question is, did you remember any positive time or did you believe everything that you were told? I mean, I would say both. That's what kind of causes, I think, the experience of cognitive dissonance that I hear a lot of us talk about. You remember positive times with the targeted parent, but that doesn't stop you from believing all the things that you've heard. So it just creates this confusion. You're like, I, but this person is terrible, but this is really, I'm having a really nice time. This is really fun, if that makes sense. I would agree with that also. It, it created a lot of confusion because I would have, like, I remember having some happy memories with my dad. I wasn't very close to my dad just because of the dynamics of being my mom's little therapist, but my dad when he got a chance to really let loose and play with us, he was very playful. He was very fun. And so like remembering like that's who he was with us, but then being told like, no, he's awful. He's abusive. He doesn't love you. It definitely created a lot of confusion, believing it, but not believing it. I just not knowing what to make of it basically. You know, I think another layer that that makes me think of Bree is that my dad did the the thing where he remarried and had you know, more children. So he had a sort of second family. So that was used very much against him by my mom. And I remember also feeling like I would feel sadness because my dad was like a goofball dad. He was like the dad who was always doing a bazillion things, just being silly and like, you know, fart jokes and all that kind of stuff. And um, I remember, you know, we'd be going out and he would do something really funny and we'd all be laughing and I'd you know be there with my, I guess, half brother and half sister. And, um, and then I would, I would feel sad later, like, well, that, you know, that was fun. And I have a real, you know, my dad's fun and and fun to be around, but he only loves them. He doesn't love me. So in a way it felt like the pleasant times that I had with him also then emphasized the the sadness or made it a little bit harder. Can I ask you a follow-up question to that? It's not on one on the list, but when you go back to mom's house, did you say you had a good time or did you find yourself also figuring out what you were supposed to say when you got home if you had a good time? For me, I would get home from my dad's house if I ever went and it would be, 
Oh, so, so many questions. Did you have fun with your dad? What did your stepmom look like? Oh, I bet they were talking bad about me again, weren't they? They hate me. Like, I, I bet you want to live at your dad's house. It's so much nicer and bigger than my house. I bet you want to stay there all the time, even though I barely went with him. And so it would just be me having to reassure her, no, mom, I love your house. Your house is nice too. I didn't have a good time. I don't like spending time with them. I hate going there. Like reassuring her that she was the more, more important parent and that I was still essentially on her side. I feel like my mom would have something prepared to show me that my experience had been negative. So um, it would be, oh, well, you know, I got a call from your stepmother and she said that you were really, you know, you behaved so badly and gosh, it's just so hard for them to have you there. And I heard a lot of reports about things that my stepmother or my dad had said about me in like phone calls to her. And so I would come home and I would have felt like, oh, you know, I had fun. We, you know, whatever. My dad had a, a cabin at a lake. And so, oh, we went water skiing and, you know, goofed around and played in the water and it was so fun. And then I'd come home and my mom would be like, you know, I heard um, from your father and your stepmother that you were really, you know, rude and you weren't participating enough with the family, whatever it was, but there were always things that were brought up that were complaints that she alleged came from my dad and stepmom that I, I know for sure at this point didn't happen. For me, I lost my visits with my dad because I was showing that I liked him too much or that I was showing that I was having too much fun. When I finally got visitized visits, which was three years after being taken from him, she used threats on me. She used, like, why did you want to do that anyways, you know, like... It's stupid. He doesn't love you. Any form of me showing love or happiness with it, I couldn't do so. I was always making sure to keep my reactions to like a minimal so I would still be technically on her side. Okay. The next question is, is your connection with your alienated parent as loving and strong as you wished for or do you just casually talk to each other now? Uh, my relationship with my dad is not as close as I want it to be. I think he still has a lot of healing to do on his end. I'm open to having a really close relationship with him, but I feel like he's just kind of like, I don't know if he's just scared um, and I don't blame him, but I feel like my relationship with him is kind of like a weird uncle. It doesn't feel like a father-daughter relationship. It feels like more distant relative, you know, and when, when I talk to him occasionally, you know, we're always laughing together, but it just isn't, it doesn't have like that, that closeness that I wish that we did. I think my relationship with my dad now is strong in certain ways because I understand now what he went through when they got divorced, how he was um, discarded, rejected, and completely smeared. And so we understand each other in the ways that I was the only targeted child. So my brothers, my four younger brothers, they don't understand the first thing about any of this, really. And so we do have that experience. But at the same time, the the pure and completely untainted bond that we had when I was a child, I was 100% daddy's girl. He's my best friend. I, I don't think that there's ever a way to get back to how it was initially, but I guess that's with every other relationship in life. However, I do find that with time, I get more and more comfortable interacting with him, calling him. At, uh, we talk almost every day. So I would say that for me, I challenge myself at every term to be more and more forthcoming with him, to go out on a limb and trust him and to try to challenge my thoughts whenever they come up automatically around my beliefs with about who he is. I was able to get to a point where I would, of a relationship that I wanted to have with my dad i'm at the stage where i'm really feeling the loss of you know those decades where i had misperceptions about him because he's 86 and i don't know how much longer he's he's going to be around you know his hearing's going he doesn't remember things as much and i missed out on really prime years of him being like a dad dad like you know the fun dad it's really um kind of a poignant realization that I lost time that I'm never getting back and that time isn't infinite. When I first saw him again, it was more support than I could have ever imagined, more freedom. 
I felt so happy and light and just like on top of the world like with how free I felt I really struggle with being truthful like just being open and honest and not like being scared of it he's definitely been my rock like he's helped me a lot for me my dad and my relationship is still pretty strained where everybody was uh separated from their targeted parent i remained at in the same home with both of my parents and it was just active alienation while still living in the same home with my dad i seen him every day so it felt very much more i guess personal for him he has a lot more healing to do as well and you know before he and i can really reunify okay next question is what is the most important thing for people to know about parental alienation that it exists and it's real which you might not know if you're just like looking around online there are a lot of people who are claiming that this doesn't exist um, and it very much does yeah i agree that it exists also that the effects of it can last forever i mean i'm getting close to being in my 40s i mean i'm late 30s at this point and there are still days that i cry about missing my dad, you know, and, and just the time that we lost. I wish people knew that it exists and that the damage is is pretty significant. Anyone else have anything to add to that? I, I guess just piggybacking what everybody else said that it not only affects perhaps your self-esteem, which you can expect, or your ability to have secure attachment styles with relationships, which again, people might expect, but that it can affect literally every single aspect of who you are and how you operate in the world, including your physical health, because the uh, chronic stress can impact your immune system, causing autoimmune disorders and other uh, health issues. It can shrink your hippocampus, which is part of your brain that is um, responsible for like learning and memory. It causes very often high rates of suicidality and suicide attempts. You can't quantify the damage done. It affects generations. It's a generational form of abuse that can be often passed down. I think I've seen the statistic in many places that 50% of alienated children go on to become either alienators themselves or targeted parents. So this can persist for generations and spread like a toxin throughout society. Just that it's teaching the child to hate themselves. You know, it's you hating the parent, which is hating the child. And then now you're teaching a child that they're not lovable because of that. Like, I remember any qualities of my dad that I had. Like, I was like, I felt like I was bad, like I was gross for it, or like I was making her upset. And now I'm like, like, she used to call me goofy. And I'm like, now I love being goofy. But yeah, it just teaches you to hate yourself. And it's horrible. Like, I don't know how you can look at a child and be like, hate this person, hate your dad that you love so much. Really fantastic answers, by the way, you guys. I'm so grateful you let me jump in and, and be a part of this. Um, the next question kind of follows up with what you guys were just talking about. And the next question is, what do you think is the biggest misconception about alienated kids? Maybe that we wanted the separation with our parent. I I know when you're being that manipulated and you're saying like hateful things to or about your parent, people might believe that that's genuine, but that's not really coming from you. You know, you're, that's influenced by your other parent. And so, I, I mean, I see how people on the outside who haven't experienced this on on one side or the other being a kid or being a targeted parent, I can see how people could believe that the kids have something to do with it, but it really, it's not the kid's fault. I mean, when they're, they're manipulated and and basically trained to hate, and then they do it like out of survival, especially if you have a, if your alienator is, you know, dealing with like a mental illness or a personality disorder, you do what you've got to do to survive. And if it seems like 
going along with what they're saying is the safest route, you know, then that's what you do. And I, and I think not believing that this is severe abuse, I guess would be a misconception because I do believe this, this is very severe child abuse. I think a big misconception I see with targeted parents is that their child is angry and hates them. And while that might be uh, somewhat true in a certain way, I think for myself, at least, I, I remember most of the time just feeling profound sadness and pain. And the anger was a way to cover that up. Yeah, I would say 100%. I mean, I I have my youngest son right now, 16. He's severely alienated. But, I mean, the things that he says and that he writes to me are just, they are so vicious. And, you know, he's saying over and over again that he doesn't love me, that he doesn't have one scintilla of feeling towards me whatsoever. And, I mean, what it sounds like to somebody, you know, a, a, maybe a third party is that he hates me. But what I hear is that he's really, really hurt. Madison, if it's okay, I have a question that's a little off script. It's not one of the ones that was sent in, but it is one that I have. I guess when the argument is made that the child's voice needs to be heard, how do we pick out the authenticity of the voice versus what you guys were influenced to say? Being able to talk to everyone you know, and like, there's so many lies that are being able to be like passed around. And it's like, it could be all avoided if everyone in the situation was talked to. And not just separately where one can lie about the other, where everyone is able to be like, hey, this is actually the truth of what's going on. Everyone's like free and talking with a professional there. I feel like You'd be able to tell the lies from the truth easy, at least easier, and it wouldn't take months of processes to get through. Nobody really talked in my situation, and now I'm talking to people that were friends and stuff, and they all can, like, back the story. They can all say different ways that my mom was abusive and doing this, and it's like... You didn't talk. One of my jobs is to help make those determinations. And even if I see, and I love Kyla's suggestion, I've often said that, can we just put everybody in one room so that we can, it'll, it'll come out faster because it is hard to go from person to person to person and then keep track of what everybody has said, but just finding the authenticity and often, even when I see it, it's hard to express what it is because I can see the disconnect, but it's not easy to verbalize in something that will make sense to somebody who doesn't really understand the situation. So it's really difficult for people in my position to, even if we see it, how do we get other people to see it too? Especially when the cry is, the child says they don't want to go. Why aren't we listening to the child? So in that situation, ladies, why wouldn't I listen to the child? Children don't do want to do a lot of things. I mean, I, I guess, you know, there are some things that are really obvious, you know, kids like, ah, I don't want to go to school today. Well, too bad. You have to. I don't think that a child should be enabled to cut off a relationship with their parent same way they wouldn't be able to choose to stop going to a doctor or stop going to school or whatever it might be. I think that if they're, if a child is severely rejecting a parent, it's most likely alienation. Parents are not rejected for abuse the way that alienated parents are rejected by their children. But it's, it, to me, it just seems so obvious. Th this is the one instance in which children will react this way. Regardless of what they say, their behaviors indicate alienation just hearing that question it's just like if you were to have asked just asking the why you know why are you saying no what is happening for you to be saying no to your parent for me like i could never ask that question and they let me get away with just saying i don't know and like i would break down crying whenever they would like bring up my dad because i was so hurt and distraught over it so it's like if you were to have asked me why I wouldn't have been able to answer it. And so it's like, so what am I making the decision over? Me as a teenager, I probably would have been a really tough case to crack because 
I was so angry and rejecting my parent that if a counselor or somebody would have asked me about it, I would have stuck to my guns. And, you know, unless they spent more time with me, maybe like breaking down the why, not only asking questions about how I feel about my dad, but getting into the dynamics that I have with my mom, they probably would have been able to uncover the parentification that was happening because I really did feel like I had to take care of my mom. And since my mom was so triggered by anything that my dad said or did, he was the bad guy in her eyes. I felt like I had to be loyal to her and to take care of her. Not having a relationship with my dad was like the ultimate way that I I could ensure that she would be okay. A thought just came to me um, about asking the child or somehow or making it known to the child that it's unacceptable for their parent to be talking about their other parent in a negative way. I think that's something important I wish I had learned as a young child. Perhaps interviewing the child and the parent, the alienating parent separately, you would hear a lot of the same verbiage and probably a lot of the same explanations for why this is happening. Probably even words or phrases that are beyond their years. Thanks, you guys. You are definitely confirming a lot of things. Did anybody else want to add anything? We have one more question on the list, and this one's kind of a big one, especially for targeted parents. What tips do you have for writing a letter to your alienated child? In my mid-20s, my dad wrote me a letter that was basically a love letter. He writes really well, and um, he just wrote about the experience of becoming a father and how there is no greater love in your life than the love you feel for your first child. And it was so heartfelt. It was beautifully written. There was nothing, you know, he wasn't talking about anything from the past. It was just that, you know, I've watched you grow up in your whole life and I've loved you and I've been proud of you at every moment. And you are the great love of my life. And um, it, that hit, it was, really, really meaningful. That was what I needed to hear because that's what was missing. And um, what I thought really resonated was that it was um, a letter. I mean, this was, I'm old, (laughs) I'm in my fifties. So it was an actual letter sent through the mail. He even printed it on like fancy paper. And it was just really, it was beautifully written. And his primary message was just, I love you. And he didn't set up expectations that I needed to do anything or react. It was just him telling me. And it was, um, kind of perfect. Jocelyn, you were talking about earlier how your mom made you believe that your step-siblings were more important in your dad's eyes than you were and that he loved them more. And in the same way, my mom always said that once my brothers were old enough to play baseball, uh, football, and go hunting and fishing, my dad forgot about me and he loves the boys more than me. So I think the alienator, often I've seen this, not just in my case, but in talking to other people too, that not only do they make the child believe that their targeted parent doesn't love them, but that their targeted parent loves other children more than them. So I think something in the letter could be really effective if they were to really make the child feel special and maybe say some things that the alienator is probably not telling them, like, I love the person you are. I'm proud to be your dad or your mom. Definitely depends on, like, the age or, like, the circumstance with it. But I know for my dad, um, during visit high's visits, when they were looking for anything to say that it was bad, that was coming out of him, you know? So, like, when you have something that's under scrutiny, especially when the kid's young, where everything's being monitored and stuff like that, um, he would keep it the same thing, where he would just say, see you soon, love you, Kyla. Yeah, with stickers on it, and he would cut it out as a heart. So he kept it the same thing, and then when... I was 13, something like that. He just wrote me a letter talking about how, because he was going to have a kid. So just basically being like, you know, like I'm not forgetting you and just saying how much he loved me and it wasn't about moving on or whatnot. So when you get older, writing a heartfelt letter, 
Um, he also had writings where he kept aside of when I was younger. Um, during the times where he was just reading me the notes with the same messages on it. Um, and I would get those like once a week. But yeah, he kept some heartfelt notes aside, which he's showed me now. It makes me cry. <laughs> on that note, can I add one little thing? What would be detrimental for them to write to their alienated child? If they do what the alienator is, has done to them. Um, if they start bashing the alienator, you know, an alienated child has already been told your parent doesn't love you. They were abusive. They were abusive to your alienating parent. And so if the targeted parent comes back and basically does a smear campaign on the alienator, it just further confirms that the alienator is right in their eyes. And putting any blame on the child, maybe you can talk about that with your friends or anyone else outside of the situation. But in the letter specifically, I would refrain from talking about anything painful in the past. I would refrain from talking about the alienator or placing any blame or criticism on the child. Yeah, I would second that. Um, you know, definitely any anger or sense of indignation or even sadness really doesn't have a place in in this kind of a a reaching out. Also not setting expectations, um, just being kind of in the present. I I love you. I'm your parent. I've always loved you. Um, And, you know, you can leave the door open without really pressuring. Just, you know, I just want you to know I'm, I'm always here, but without really having expectations, just sort of put it out there. Because I think it's um, for a lot of these kids, I mean, yeah, there might be an aha moment, but there's going to be a lot of build up to that aha moment. So the more kind of touch points you can have with your child, where consistently over the months or years or decades, you are just continuing to show them the person that you truly are as their parent and the love that you have. And so if that messaging is consistent and positive, um, eventually, you know, and without putting any expectations on it, eventually it should start to sink in more and more. Madison, those were all the questions on the list. And I don't know if you wanted to continue the conversation, but I have a question that it might be like too emotional to ask. I don't know. I just thought of it. Is there anything that you guys would say to any people out there who are currently alienating their children or anything you would say to your alienator? To somebody alienating their child, um, I actually know somebody. I haven't spoken to her. Um, But if I did get a chance to talk to her, I would tell her just the way that I have felt uh, as a child and how how it's impacted me as an adult and, and what the result has been. Like, you know, she wants to keep this child all to herself. She doesn't want to co-parent and she... She hates the the child's dad, but what's going to end up happening is that, you know, the same thing could happen to her, you know, with being estranged from her child. If he ever finds out the truth, he might have to break ties with her. And I know that that would be like her worst nightmare. Like she does, she would not want that to happen. So if I could tell a, you know, an alienator, a tip would be like, don't do it. Stop. Like really consider the impact that you're having on your child's self-esteem and and their future relationships and their future relationship with you as an adult because they're not going to be kids forever. Like they won't be in your control forever. That was actually a really great question, Madison. Thank you to everybody who's been here tonight. It seems as if alienated children, despite their age, even if they are adults, experience very high rates of suicidality and suicide attempts over 30%, which is appalling and unacceptable. At the end of the day, that's why I created this project. And I believe that's why we're all here today to raise awareness and say, no, enough is enough. We are not okay with this. Millions of children are experiencing all of these really painful and self-destructive effects of parental alienation right now. Millions of children, way more than anyone would would want to know or expect, including 
self-harm, suicidality, eating disorders, very self-destructive effects, negative beliefs about yourself that you're bad, unwanted, unloved. We're using our voices because all of these millions of children right now have been stripped of their voices. To anyone, any other formerly alienated children out there listening, you're not alone. You're not crazy. What I've learned in talking to dozens of child survivors now is that if you take a child and put them through alienation, particularly um, more severe alienation, um, predictable effects will play out in your life. And I think most of the time by the end of it, especially once you learn the truth and everything, you're left feeling like a shell of yourself and feeling like you're the crazy one. And you're not. You might not believe that yet, but you're not. And I want to affirm all of you on this call, Jocelyn, Bree, Kyla, Jacqueline, you are a survivor. There is power in numbers. Our group is growing, and I do believe that one day, once we have the numbers, we can make some real legislative changes as well. I truly believe that, and I hope for that. It's an honor for me to have met all of you. Thank you, Tina, so much for being here tonight and on our other support calls. It means so much to me that you're volunteering your time and your expertise, and that you're also just taking care of all these other alienated children out there. I'm just really excited to continue on our healing journeys together. And I just want to say thank you guys so much. That's all for this video. I hope that you found this Q&A panel to be insightful or helpful. Please leave your thoughts and reactions below in the comments. Give this video a thumbs up to get it in the algorithm and subscribe to my channel if you like what I'm doing here. Please be on the lookout for more opportunities to submit your questions for upcoming panels. And if you are a child survivor of parental alienation, please email me at theantialienationproject at gmail.com to become part of the support group I've created for child survivors of parental alienation. Thank you everyone for watching. It means so much to me and I appreciate your time. I'll see you next time. Bye.